everyone, welcome back. This is the second part of the three-part series where I break down the main financial statements of a company and talk through what the line items I'm looking for mean and what trends I'm specifically looking out for. If you haven't watched the first video, the link is here. In that video, we covered the income statement. I'll be making a third video covering the statements of cash flow, which will be available shortly also. So continuing off where continuing where we left off, we've been looking at Apple's 2023 10K. I won't rehash where to find this as that is covered in part one. So let's just jump right into it. So taking a 10,000 foot step back, let me explain what the balance sheet is. It is a snapshot in time of everything that a company owns, owes, and is left over for shareholders. This financial statement will balance, hence the name of the balance sheet. What this means is the assets of any company will be equal to their liabilities and shareholders' equity. This is an incredibly common formula. If you take any intro to accounting class, they will drill this into your head. And once again, that is its assets equals liabilities plus shareholders' equity. Now, this really won't be super relevant for us for valuations. If you're ever trying to build a balance sheet from a company's financials, it can be frustrating as sometimes things will not balance. But for evaluation, we don't care if it balances, we're only pulling certain line items out. So we don't need to get bogged down in how to balance the balance sheet today. That won't be necessary. So let's quickly break down those three high level areas of a balance sheet before we dive into each area of Apple's. So starting with assets, these are everything that a company company owns or is owed. For Apple, this will be things like inventory of iPhones, money owed to them by suppliers, buildings that they own, manufacturing equipment, basically anything the company has purchased will show up on their balance sheet assuming they have not sold it. We will see some other items that are not as easy to understand like Goodwill, but we will discuss this once we move through their actual balance sheet in detail. Next, we have liabilities. This is everything that the company owes. So for Apple, this could be things like debt, which usually a company will use bonds or notes and investors will buy them. Apple receives the cash, then pays it back over time with a predetermined interest rate. So that debt will show up on the balance sheet. Accounts payable is one you will almost always see. This is things like money owed to suppliers, to employees sometimes. Um, if we remember from part one, everything is done on an accrual basis and not a cash, cash basis. So if a supplier provides us with a bunch of parts and they give us 90 days to pay them, for those 90 days, we would accrue the expense and it would show up under accounts payable as a liability until we paid off with cash. So high level, it's everything we owe to someone else. And lastly, we have shareholders equity. This will usually be three main items, but it represents in theory what is left over for shareholders after dividends have been paid out. If the company were to go ahead and go away, so liquidate everything they owned. We'll rarely, we will rarely, if ever, actually look at this section um, when we're modeling a company, it's not super relevant for us. So let's open up Apple's 2023 10K and go to section eight for the financial statements. We'll scroll down past the income statement and the statement of comprehensive income to get to their balance sheet. The balance sheet will always start out with the assets and more specifically, current assets. Think of a current asset as something that has liquidity and can be accessed within roughly three months. For example, your bank account you have would be a current asset. Any investments that you have in a publicly traded company would be in would be a current asset. If you had investments in real estate where it would be difficult to liquidate and pull that money out, it would be a non-current asset. So essentially the split is based on how quickly you can liquidate or access those assets. This is important as a subset of current assets will be used for our model when calculating working capital. Current assets will almost always start out with cash or cash equivalents. This is really straightforward. It's how much cash the company has. Equivalents here are simply things like treasury bonds or other very liquid stable assets protected from downside risk, AKA market risk. Then we will, here we will see Apple actually has marketable securities. We treat this the same as cash in all honesty. This is any investment in the stock or bond market that Apple can quickly and easily convert to cash. Next, we have accounts receivable. This is money owed to Apple by third party. For Apple, this could be things like a large distributor like AT&T or Verizon, maybe Target, a big retailer that purchases large volumes of Apple products to resell. Usually they're gonna have payment terms of 30, 60, 90 days, depending on the credit worthiness of the customer. Something to note here is that not all accounts receivable will actually be collected. There's an expense account called bad debt. And when Apple is unable to collect, they would debit this, this expense account and credit their 
accounts receivable, essentially recognizing a loss for the inability to collect. For Apple, this isn't a huge concern, but for a firm, it can be. If your customer base is heavily concentrated to a handful of customers, you could run into serious issues if one of your customers, for whatever reason, were unable to pay their debt. A purely hypothetical example here is NVIDIA. They mention in their financials that something like 10 customers makes up 50% of their revenue. If they are extending credit to these 10 customers to allow them to pay in 30, 60, 90 days post delivering GPUs, and if one of those customers faced cash flow problems, then NVIDIA may not be able to actually collect even though they've delivered their goods. So it's always good to see revenue coming from lots of places and not heavily concentrated with a few customers. Anyways, next we see vendor non-trade receivables. This is very similar to accounts receivable, but it's money owed to Apple that is not related to a service or product that Apple has sold them. In Apple's case, they mentioned they sell components to their manufacturing partners who manufacture sub-assemblies or assemble final products for the company. So it's a part that Apple manufactures themselves and then is then sold to a third party to then be added back into their products that are then sold to customers. It's a bit circular uh, sounding to me, so I would guess it's highly specialized part that's difficult to manufacture that Apple has developed the, the capabilities to do in-house. So after this, we then get to inventories. This is pretty straightforward with just one nuance. This is not just completed products sitting in packages ready to be shipped out, but also raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. So raw materials are actual, are actual components that would be assembled into a finished product. Work in process are half-assembled laptops, for example, and finished goods are the final product ready to be sold and shipped, probably sitting in a warehouse somewhere. The main thing to note here is we don't want to see large growth in inventories, as that could show a couple of bad signs, either bad planning by the company or reduced demand and an inability to sell through inventory. The last thing will be other current assets line, which is just a bunch of other random small things. So we will glance over that for now. The big thing we want to focus on here is how cash is trending. So cash and cash equivalents and marketable securities. It's good to see this number growing and not shrinking. Then secondly, we'll need to look at all the current asset accounts that are not cash related to calculate their working capital. We'll circle back to this at the end. Now onto the non-current assets. The only thing I tend to pay attention to here is marketable securities. This is the same as cash, but a little hard to access. So this could be some long-term bonds, stocks that are not held for sale, things like that. We'll end up adding this back actually to our current asset cash balance to get a total cash. You'll usually see a property plant and equipment. I tend to ignore this on the balance sheet. It's the balance of the property plant and equipment prices net of depreciation. So we want to actually see the number going up, uh, but it doesn't show the real picture of what is being spent on a quarterly basis on CapEx. We'll get that on the statement of cash flows and we'll cover that in part three of this video series. Now we will jump into liabilities, very similar to assets in that it's split into current and non-current. So starting with current, we see accounts payable. This is the opposite of accounts receivable. It's money Apple actually owes to others. Next, we'll see current liabilities, other current liabilities. This is random small things we can ignore and not worry about. And then we have deferred revenue. This represents revenue that has been collected by Apple, but can't actually be recognized yet based on gap. There's guidelines for when you can and cannot recognize revenue, and it's not aligned to when the cash is actually collected by Apple all the time. So some big items that would fall into here would be Apple TV subscription revenue, Apple Music subscription revenue, any other subscriptions that they sell on an annual basis. A customer would pay up front for an entire year, and Apple can only actually recognize revenue over the life of that subscription. So one twelfth of the money collected would be recognized per month over the course of a year until the full amount was recognized. Another big item falling here would most likely be Apple Care, as those are usually two plus year contracts uh, for customer support that a customer would pay for up front. So hopefully that makes sense on what can cause deferred revenue. Next, we see commercial paper. This is short-term debt that Apple has. Then we will see term debt, which can be the 
which will be the current portion. Um, so they may have a 10 year loan or something and have quarterly payments. So that quarterly portion would show up here and then the remainder would show up under non-current liabilities. And you can actually dig into a 10K and find a debt schedule, but we're not gonna cover that in this video. So now that's all we have. Let's go over to the non-current liabilities. In this, we can see they have term debt. Um, and we'll use that to calculate the total debt, which will help us get to an enterprise value. Um, I'll hit on this later. There is then the other line, which we can largely ignore. The last section is shareholders equity. And for modeling, we actually just ignore this. These numbers are used to make sure assets and liabilities balance based on the formula that I mentioned at the beginning. So if you have any net income that was not used up by assets or liabilities, it would flow through and show up here in retained earnings or possibly a deficit if you used up all your net income. You'll also see a common stock and paid in capital line, and this is largely worthless. It's an old reporting structure where you can declare a par value that's completely arbitrary and meaningless, and then you use that to calculate a number that means just about nothing to us as investors. So I largely ignore the shareholders' equity. There's not any trends or anything relevant that I'm looking for here when I'm doing a financial model. So now let's quickly talk on working capital and net debt. These are the two main things we wanna take away from the balance sheet. So to calculate working capital, first we will add up all the current assets that are non-cash. So for Apple, we would add up the accounts receivable, vendor non-trade receivables, inventories, and other current assets. This would get us roughly $82 billion. Now to calculate the current liabilities, excluding debt and deferred revenue. This would consist of accounts payable, other current liabilities. And when we add this up, we get $121 billion. You then net these two together by subtracting current liabilities from current assets. And in this case, we would get negative $40 billion. What this means is Apple is actually generating $40 billion in cash that they can leverage and use just from their payment terms they owe people $121 billion that they haven't paid out, so this is cash that they have kept on hand, while they are only owed $80 billion, which is cash they haven't collected. So net this together, you come out negative $40 billion, which is $40 billion ahead from a cash position. This is good. It shows they have power to extend favorable terms for themselves, and when we build a valuation model, we'll actually look at the change in working capital from year to year basis to see how much this is actually impacting their cash flows. Now, the last thing we want to talk, we want to take away from the balance sheet is their net debt. To calculate this, we take their total debt and subtract their total cash. So for Apple, they have roughly 120 billion in debt between the term debt and commercial paper, while they have 162 billion in cash. So they have a net debt of negative 40 billion. And what this means is they could pay off all their debt with cash and still have $40 billion left over. The reason we need to understand this is once again, when we build a model, we end up with their enterprise value, which represents the entire value of the company. The, the formula for enterprise value is market cap plus debt minus cash. So in this case, the enterprise value would be lower than the equity value as they have a negative net debt. So if you were to purchase all of the equity and take control of Apple, you could immediately pay off all of their debt and pocket the remainder of the cash, making the enterprise value actually slightly less than just the equity value. So that's it, that's all, the that's all we have for the balance sheet. We really only care about cash, debt, and then current assets and current liabilities. This will give us a good idea if they have too much debt, if they're bleeding cash, and if they have good terms with their suppliers and other third parties. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and look out for part three on the cash flow statement soon. And then I'll probably make a final video actually where we pull it all together into a valuation model. So thanks so much for watching and leave any questions or comments below and I'll get back to you.